Welcome back to Pod for the People, Episode 6. If this is your first time tuning in, this is a weekly podcast designed to keep you plugged in and connected to what's going on in and around Santa Cruz. Each week, we explore the work, the philosophies, and the guiding principles of people doing great things in our community. I'm your host, Drew Glover, born and raised here in Santa Cruz, California, and candidate for the Santa Cruz City Council elections this November, working to provide a window into my personal world, the people that I work with, and the issues that impact the people and the environment around our city. Of course, I want to let everyone know that the podcast that you're listening to was created with the help of the 365 Producer Program. The 365 Producer is an artist training program located right here in Santa Cruz. 365 producer students learn all the skills you need to create podcasts just like this one, as well as music, video, photography, and artist development. Check them out at 365producer.com. Last week, we heard from local filmmaker and comedian Noel Murphy, who recently released a full-length documentary on the life and philosophies of R. Buckminster Fuller. We spoke about ephemeralization, doing more with less, and how we can make uh, Santa Cruz a place that works for everyone. But today, we're joined by a local legend, a uh, name known by everyone that I work with, Professor Emeritus at UCSC John Brown Childs. John Brown Childs is a Professor Emeritus of Sociology at UC Santa Cruz. He's the author of Trans Communality, From the Politics of Conversion to the Ethics of Respect, among other books. He's also co-editor of Global Visions Beyond the New World Order, editor of Hurricane Katrina, Response and Responsibilities, and co-editor with Guillermo Delgado of Indigenity. Indigenity? Yeah. Uh, ind that's it. Uh, indigenity? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, collected essays. He took part in the civil rights movement in Montgomery, Alabama in 1965 as a member of Friends of SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In 1997, he was awarded the Fulbright Thomas Jefferson Chair of Distinguished Teaching in the Netherlands at the University of Ultrecht. As a volunteer with the community organization Barrios Unidos and its prison project, he teaches courses about transcommunal cooperation and peacemaking to those incarcerated in the California prison system. He was born in 1942 in Boston's Bataan Court housing project in the Roxbury section of the city. Of African Madagascan and Native American descent, he is a registered member of the Massachusetts, you have to correct me here, yeah. Ponca. Poag? Yeah, that's good. That's yeah. good. Ponkapoag tribe of Indians in Massachusetts. Uh, like I mentioned, he works in the prison project with Barrios Unidos, spe specifically working in the Soledad prison and implementing concepts of trans communality, Kingian nonviolence, and a bunch of other great things. So, welcome to the show, John. It's an honor to have you with us. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, uh, an impressive resume, to say the least, uh, with you. everything that you've been able to accomplish in your time on the planet. Mm. Um, but before we get into all the great work that you're doing and that list of amazing things, I'd like to start with just sharing with the listeners a little bit about where you come from and what got you into the work. Well, it's uh, just out of respect for my ancestors, and I, I appreciate your uh, mentioning the Madagascan, Native American, African background. Uh, my mother was born in Massachusetts, and she was a Native American person who belonged to the Massachusetts Ponkapog uh, tribe of Indians. Um, when she was in, a, in her 20s, as a young woman in the 1930s, she went south to Alabama to teach in a congregational church school for young African-American kids uh, who were children of sharecroppers. Mm. So they didn't get to school very often, and there really was no public education for them. Uh, but she, along with other teachers, uh, gave them a really decent education, uh, even though they were in the middle of uh, Ku Klux Klan country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there that she met my father, John Brown Childs, uh, after whom I'm named. He was named, after, by the way, after John Brown, the abolitionist. So and I, I was born December, this is a footnote, I was born December 2nd, 1942. Many years later, I realized that December 2nd is the date that John Brown was hanged uh, by the federal government for his raid on Harpers Ferry when he tried to uh, liberate people from slavery. Wow. Um, my father later died on the same date that John Brown was born. There's some, there's some other funny connections wow. there. Wow, the universe. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mentioned that in part because uh, that's 
one of the things that I think has propelled me to thinking about society, trying to contribute in some way to the best of my ability, um, there are two other influences on me. It took me a long time to figure these out in my life, but uh, one is that uh, the Native American peoples in Massachusetts, like the Wampanoag, Narragansett, the Mohegan, were pretty chewed up very early by disease and land loss or the taking of their land in the early 1600s. From colonialization. From colonialization, primarily the English uh, colonizers who arrived in that area. Uh, In 1774, a Mohegan man who was a Presbyterian preacher named Sansom Oakham. Oakham in Algonquian means the man who travels over the water. He had gone to Scotland, been ordained a Presbyterian, came back, and he led a group of refugees, refugee Native American people from southern New England to what's now upstate New York, where the Oneida Native people, part of the Great Iroquois, Great League of Peace Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee's, they call themselves, uh, gave them land or gave them the right to use some land. And there, my ancestor, along with many other Native peoples, uh, created uh, a place that they called Brother Town in English. In their own language, it was called Eyamwakanuk, which means the place of equal people. <laughs> the place without, and they tried to make it into a, a sanctuary where they could learn, they could farm, they could be themselves without being impinged upon by the uh, colonizers. It worked for a while, but the United themselves came under pressure, and that ended. My ancestors came back to uh, Massachusetts, and that's where my mother's family was from. Uh, My mother married my father in Alabama, in Birmingham, in 1936. Uh, My father's family, the Childses, uh, after the Civil War, were among six black families in Marion, Alabama, mm. not that far from Montgomery, Perry County, uh, who created a school for uh, uh, to teach African Americans to be teachers. It was called Lincoln Normal School. Normal, did, and it, it was a different kind of sense of normal, like a. Uh, uh, a school that taught how to live in society, mm-hmm. especially li- how to live in a society that was very oppressive. And that school went on to become very influential as a teaching college. Uh, many, many decades later, uh, one of the people who went to that school was Coretta Scott before she became Coretta Scott King. Wow. She was from Marion, Alabama. Uh, one of my relatives, uh, uh, G- um, Jean Childs was married to uh, Andy Young, uh, and uh, she had gone to that school. Uh, so uh, I-, I mentioned this for, t- for a reason, which is that as I look back on my career, I'm 75 years old now, I realized that uh, s- several years ago, I realized that I've been following in the footsteps of my ancestors, mm-hmm. that the, I've been following in the footsteps of those who try to create a place of freedom in Brothertown, New York, and in the footsteps of those who try to create a place of freedom in Lincoln Normal School, Alabama. And even though I didn't know it for many years, I have been walking along behind them. And uh, in a sense, I'm behind them, but they're, being, they're, they're, they're propelling me still. So it's that ancestral point of origin or points of origin that really have uh, uh, assisted me in developing my work. Mm. That's one of the things I love about you and really appreciate you is your constant connection from your experience now all the way through your life to the roots and where you come from yeah. and acknowledging and giving props and awareness to the people that laid the framework that allowed us to continue the work that we're still continuing on today with fighting against oppression and racism and sexism and limited access to uh, facilities and resources. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something I talk about a lot within the campaign is the need for us to be able, and just like I mentioned from our last uh, episode that we had, was this idea of creating a space that works for everyone and providing the tools and resources needed to allow for harmonious engagement. And I love that you brought up the one who travels over the lake, because I was actually going to ask you to talk about that. There's a great talk that you have on YouTube that's uh, up there, where you go through a a great kind of synopsis or summary of everything that you just talked about, but then even moving into the civil rights era and people like Ella Baker, Mm -hmm. who gets back to this, uh, this question of society 
unity growth and there's a great quote from the report that you wrote about your experience with the prison project from ella baker um talking about the big question of society and i'm going to talk about that a little bit later when okay. we get to the prison project and how it's impacted the people there that you've been working with but um the need for connection and togetherness right it's right. difficult and in the world that we live in that is kind of rife with disconnection and fear and frustration and anger mm -hmm. and the seemingly difficult task of people with different perspectives that may be opposite to each other to be able to come together and discuss the issues respectfully and cognitively so that they can come to an understanding of where each one is coming from and then move forward into a mutually beneficial future instead of it being one over the other in right. the sense of combativeness. So what you know, what are some tools that we can do? I, I work at the Resource Center for Nonviolence, and it's wonderful that you implement Kingian nonviolence in the work that you do in the prison project, because I train in Kingian nonviolence, right, and right. it's these ideas of unity and empathy and nonviolent con conflict reconciliation to be able to see a person, understand their background and their experience, and then move forward in that conversation from a space of putting yourself in their shoes trying to understand how they came to that uh, understanding and then see the the human side of each other, how they got there and right. then moving into something better. So, I mean, that's some, some powerful work. Well, uh, let me give you two um, angles on this. At least they work for me. Uh, one is a, a Zen uh, poem, a riddle that I saw many years ago that uh, goes like this. I thought I saw a red bearded man then I realized it was a man with a red beard. And I, trans I thought about that for a long time and uh, transposed it a little bit uh, to, I thought I saw a slave, then I realized it was a man held in slavery. Mm -hmm. And you know, words are tricky. And I mean, there's obviously in that description, there's an objective condition, which is enslavement. But the first way of putting it, a, calling a man a slave implies or gives you the feeling that that's his total description, mm -hmm. that his heart, his mind, his soul are enslaved. The second version is, yeah, there's enslavement, but uh, held, being held in slavery tells me nothing about what's going on inside that person's heart, mm -hmm. that person's brain, that person's soul. Uh, and I think for me, uh, I, I always have to keep that in mind when I'm working with people, uh, people who might have very different views from mine, that uh, I, I can't, I shouldn't judge people by their uh, superficial outside uh, appearance, but uh, wait to see what's on the inside, and I hope they do the same for me. The other uh, angle is um, I've been greatly influenced by uh, the Iroquois people, the Odinoshone, Odinoshone in their language means the people, the longhouse, these were five, later six, but started out as five nations or tribes uh, in what's now upstate New York. Uh, it was the Mohawks in uh, near what's now Albany, New York, the Oneidas, mm. the ones who lent land to my ancestors from New England, uh, the Onondagas near Syracuse, the uh, Cay uh, Cayugas, uh, and then the Senecas near what's now Buffalo. And in their own history, they say that around, probably around 1300 or so, they were five warring nations engaged in a terrible war of retaliation and revenge, and it seemed never ending. And it seemed impossible that that could change because they all, each group distrusted the other group completely. In their story, uh, in their history, they say that a man appeared, whom they call the peacemaker, the Ganawida, uh, who brought a message of peace and how to bring it about. Uh, he went first, he, the, the history says, to the house of a woman named Jingasase, who was the, means uh, the woman who sits by the war path. She was a neutral, and she fed the warriors who passed between east and west to kill each other. Uh, he, so he goes to her first, and he, he announces his presence. She says, come in, and she asks him, what his message is. Of course, this is all done in Native American, uh, with Native American politeness. He actually doesn't ask him right away. Right. It's the idea that he has to eat first, this silence, and then when he's ready, he speaks. And he says, among other things, I come bringing the message of the master of life, 
that all people shall live together in peace and that they shall love each other and be all part of one community. Uh, and she says, uh, I love her response. She says, thy words are good, but what form will your words take when they come to work mm -hmm. in the world? Mm -hmm. I've always been struck by that because it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of vision going beyond the horrible realities that they were facing, but also it's very, with her input, it's very practical. Mm -hmm. You have to have a way to achieve that vision. And he did. It was a, it was a long part of the history that goes into that, but the short version <laughs> is that the Odinoshone, as their name implies, lived in longhouses. And these were multi-family uh, structures, buildings, and each family had its own autonomous place. They had their own fire, uh, and they, no other family, no one else could tell them what to do, how to do it. However, if there was a problem, say, with the, uh, the roof, and it needed repairing, everyone had to take part in repairing the roof. Right. So when it was necessary, they came together as one group. When that was not necessary, they acted as separate autonomous people, and they respected each other on that basis. And the peacemaker says to her, using it that longhouse is a metaphor, we shall be like the longhouse. Uh, each nation shall have its freedom and its autonomy, but each nation shall live in one large structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is very much like Martin Luther King's uh, image of the world house, right. which there are many different rooms, but there's one structure. And if the structure goes down, everyone goes down. If it needs to be built up, everyone needs to be involved in building it up. Uh, so that, those, are the, those are two of my uh, influences. And transcommunality, which is really based on that uh, Haudenosaunee longhouse model. And by the way, not too try to claim to be Haudenosaunee. This is not a, uh, an attempt to be something that I'm not or ask other people to be something that they're not. But as one of the Haudenosaunee elders, John Mohawk, pointed out to me one time, if we can read Plato and Aristotle without being ancient Greeks, right. we can learn also from our uh, predecessors who created the Great League of Peace. So that's the, that's the, the uh, uh, basis on which I find it very important. And the essence of it is mutual respect, recognizing that not, we cannot always agree on everything, uh, learning how to, it's hard enough to reach agreement when you have a lot of different viewpoints. It's even harder to disagree in a way that is respectful and, and doesn't result in people running out the door or being thrown out the door. Right. Uh, or shutting down. Shutting down. So uh, the, 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 the image of the longhouse, the autonomy, as well as the idea uh, uh, that is key to this uh, whole approach uh, is um, what I would call, uh, is, it's simple, like engaged, disengaged, or on and off uh, as options. So I work, say I work with you, you work with me, and maybe we have a real fundamental disagreement on some key issue that's okay. I mean, at that point, the Iroquois would say, okay, you go to your corner, I'll go to mine, we'll do our own work, but on things that we can't agree upon, we'll come back together. Mm -hmm. But we won't hate each other, we won't dislike each other. It's just part of the human condition that we cannot reach for agreement all the time. And that's what is working, I believe, in, in Soledad, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along, if you don't mind. No, yeah, I've yeah. been looking forward to hearing about it. And just some of the things that you said cued some thoughts for me. The first, though, was this idea of unity without uniformity. And in Dr. Yeah. King's book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos, Our Community, he talks about the importance of unity, but not confusing unity with uniformity. Right. Just because you're working with other people doesn't mean you have to conform 100% to their perspectives, but find out ways that you can work together to create harmony within the community amidst your conflicts and differences. And then also, you know, you mentioned the longhouse, but how that correlates to the world house. Yeah. And then it's connecting me to the other shows that we've had previous to this, like last week with Noel Murphy, who's talking about our Buckminster Fuller, who was talking about Spaceship Earth mm -hmm. and right, how we right. all need to be you know, invested yeah. in taking care of our resources because it's a shared world that we live on. And then also the week before that, we had um, Christopher Van Hall, who's a progressive Christian pastor here in, mm -hmm. in Santa Cruz, and talking about that perspective of Jesus and the Gospels of 
the need to take care of everyone and share the resources and share the world. So across, <laughs> you know, from the Native American to our Buck, Mr. Yeah. Fuller, who was an atheist, yeah. to the Christian right. progressives of the world, like there's a very consistent thread of how can we work together amidst all of our differences to respect each other, create a space that we can all flourish and thrive, but at the same time, be able to respect the differences that do exist among mm -hmm. us because that's what makes us unique and creative right. right it would be very boring if we were all the same that's right that's right <laughs> um so king in nonviolence and the prison project we've mentioned it a couple times mm -hmm. so far so you work down in soledad which is in south county with the barrio sanitos prison project mm -hmm. which is something that i think is amazing i've been <clears throat> watching it kind of from the sidelines i haven't had a chance to go and <clears throat> excuse me participate in it yet i'm waiting to get my credentials cleared so i'm hoping right, to be able to right. go in the beginning of september ideally with you right. uh, which would be really cool uh but just share your experience down there because when people hear prison when they hear inmates there's <clears throat> an initial thing that comes i'm sure into a lot of people's negative stereotypes from media and everything and that mentioning the zen poem that you said before about the red bearded man or the man with a red beard it made my mind go back to the civil rights era and the posters that said i am a man right so instead of it being a negro yeah. or a you know some other yeah. negative colloquial term it is a man who is black right and right. brings it back to that whole message so you know at some point it would be great to let everyone know about your involvement in the civil rights history but since we started talking about soledad let's do that first sure, and then we'll move sure. into that um so yeah what's going on in the soledad prison project what do you do down there and what's some of the stuff you've seen okay well first of all let me give all credit to uh nani alejandras the executive director and founder of barrios unidos mm -hmm. national coalition of barrios unidos and the creator of the prison project many many years ago i've been working with him now for 14 years but he was there before i started doing that i wouldn't be able to be there and have a certain effectiveness without Nani and, and Badrish Unidos. They just do a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the, the prison project uh, has a lot of different features, but the one I'm involved in is education. So I've been teaching courses for the past, uh, well, 14 years more or less mm. on transcommonality, exactly what we've just been talking about, how to... Uh, how do we respect each other, work together without having to be in agreement all the time? And the, the men who take these classes are African-American, Native American, Asian American, uh, uh, European, white American, whatever term. I mean, all these terms are kind of, you know, have problems, but it is a very mixed group of men who are taking these courses, uh, which goes against a lot of these stereotypes that are out there about uh, prisons as being these highly segregated uh, areas, which in some ways is true, except mm -hmm. these men have overcome that using Kingian nonviolence and transcommunality so that they can, they sit down, work together. Uh, and one of the uh, wonderful aspects of what they've been doing is that uh, two years ago, the men who had been in my classes started their own class, their own transcommonality class. And they have taken the idea and really pushing it much further than I, I had thought about myself. They, they have made it into a, uh, a really powerful yep. uh, and uh, a very positive uh, development. You know, I, when Nani and I and others from the prison project, when we leave Soledad at the end of a... Uh, at the end of our days of work there, like four hours in the evening, um, we always feel really buoyed up, really positive, which might sound strange. You say, you were in prison, you came out, I mean, you're just visiting, obviously, but came out uh, feeling positive. Yes, because what I see there, what I feel, what we feel there is the tremendous positive energy of the men inside. Uh, that, I, I don't mean any offense to any students I've had over the many, many years since I started teaching in 1975, but the best classes I've had are in Soledad. Yeah, that's you know, a big statement. You taught a, lot of, you taught a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people, and the, the, the men there, uh, they're, they're, they're tremendous positive energy. They have a great analytical capability. They're always interested in new ideas, 
and they're interested in developing ideas themselves. So um, uh, you, you won't see that on lockup on uh, you know the weekend TV no. shows. You won't see that, but it's out there, and it's not just in Soledad. There's a lot of very positive energy uh, going on inside the prison system. Yeah, and you know, in the report that you you know submitted or the essay that you wrote about your experience in the prison project which is titled peace teachers in and from california soledad prison and the link will be in the comment section so people will be able to read it uh you write about the reality that we're in this inflamed world like i'd mentioned before here's the the exact excerpt in 1967 martin luther king posed the challenge where do we go from here chaos or community Today we face a world inflamed and divided by many voices proclaiming a politics of emotion, fear, and disgust amongst entire populations. In contrast, this Soledad story and many others like it offer encouragement about people's potential, even in the midst of difficult and sometimes dangerous circumstances, to build bridges of the human spirit across which respectful, rational, and compassionate community can be created. And that's like the vision, right, for the, right. For the world. And it's amazing mm -hmm. that you're able to cultivate that in a atmosphere that most people, when they hear it, automatically go to a place of hatred, violence, and negativity. Right. But you have seen a complete opposite side of that spectrum. Right, absolutely. And by the way, uh, these the students became teachers, and I'm also a student there because mm -hmm. I, I I learn a lot. I've I've grown from being uh, the interact the positive interactions uh, inside Soledad. So uh, it, it's, uh, it certainly is a very different reality. I mean, it's a slice of reality that's very different from the, what, what the society uh, has in general about people in prison. Uh, the men who have gotten out on parole are all, all doing great work. Many of them are involved in community uh, uh, rehabilitation, community revitalization efforts. So they are uh, doing what the uh, the, the uh, Jingatsa say said to the peacemaker. They are putting, uh, they are giving form to the words and putting them to work in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's a great representation because I personally come from the perspective that everyone has an intrinsic value that they can add to the community. Right. And so this is a great example of true transformation going right. from us you know whether regard whatever the environment and positions that they came from that resulted in them being mm -hmm. in the prison system we automatically a lot of times in society see that someone was arrested or was in prison or has been convicted mm -hmm. of a crime and then automatically we just shut them out of the community uh c cover them with doubt and mistrust but in reality it looks like as you've shown from the work that you and nane and other very prominent people in the program have done have ex exemplified is that when you give people the tools that they need to be able to adequately communicate and express their feelings concerns and opinions that it will completely i use the word transform mm -hmm. revolutionize uh create an alternative model of their thought process and that model can be applied not just in prison systems but i i would like to see it applied at an uh, elementary school level for students right. because if we right. can start with this kind of mentality at a young age in our school systems then we can begin to foster and create this culture of what dr king called creating the beloved community or where we can all reach our maximum potential right right exactly exactly another great excerpt from your report is uh, referencing <clears throat> to Ella Baker, and we'll, I want to talk about this in your uh, experience in the civil rights movement as well, but you write, through their words and deeds, the group, and how do you um, pronounce the group of the... Oh, it's a Semanawak, which Semanawak. is a, a, a Nahuatl, uh, indigenous word from Mexico. It's the language that the Aztecs spoke, but it's a very widespread language, and it means one world. Semanawak. So, so, so the excerpt reads... Through their words and deeds, the Samanawak group is positively answering a still relevant question raised by the pivotal rights, pivotal civil rights activist Ella Baker, who co-founded the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. She said in 1969, the big question is what is American society? Is it the kind of society that permits people to grow and develop according to their capacity, that gives them a sense of value, not only for themselves, but a sense of value for other human beings? Right. And this gets us back to the idea of intrinsic value. We all have a role that we can play in the community that we live in and in the world that can have m 
untold rippling effects onto other people. And, you know, Curtis Relaford, who is another right, one exactly. of my personal yeah. heroes locally, <laughs> says you can't help everybody, but you can help somebody. Right. And so it's this idea of how can we not only help somebody in our own lives that might make a difference, but how can we provide the space for other people to help other people, even if they're the ones that need help? And right. it creates this creating space of empowerment right. and, and right. co-working and positivity. Yeah. So speaking of Ella Baker uh, and her work in the civil rights movement as a main lead who does, you know, doesn't get as much recognition <laughs> in all of the books. You know, we hear a lot about Dr. King and Cesar Chavez and all of the, and Rosa Parks, you know, but not so much about Ella Baker. So what was your role in the civil rights movement in general? And then what do you have to say about Ella Baker? Well, uh, I was at the university of Massachusetts Amherst where I got my undergraduate education and I was among a small group of students who started our um, own SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, chapter uh, in 1963, primarily as um, an anti-war uh, effort, but also the idea of, of what uh, SDS was calling in, uh, industrial democracy, democracy mm. for all people, very much along the lines of what you were just talking about. And uh, the SDS chapter there was very supportive of what was going on in the South in the civil rights movement. Uh, so in that vein, I joined a group called Friends of SNCC, Friends of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, the Friends of SNCC was like an auxiliary support group for the what I would call the deep workers, the mm -hmm. ones who were really were out there uh, in Alabama, Mississippi. I have a friend, Hardy Fry, who was a uh, faculty member at UCSC, but he was in SNCC, and mm -hmm. he did field work in rural Alabama, working with people whose churches had been bombed and burned down. So those are the real, those are the real uh, deep workers. Mm -hmm. I, I was just a very peripheral, in a peripheral zone, but the peripheral zone was helpful uh, in certain ways, partly just also helping to bring media attention mm -hmm. uh, to what was going on there, because a lot of there was a lot of isolation. I mean, when Hardy was out there in the in the rural part of Alabama, there wasn't any media f following him around. Yeah, there was no one to say, "Oh, look yeah, no what's internet, going on. no Twitter." Yeah, no Twitter. Yeah, yeah, no <laughs> cell phones. I mean, uh, I remember thinking pay phones were our salvation because you could go to a pay phone and make a call. Um, but uh, so I, I was I got involved through friends of SNCC, and in 1965, after the Selma to Montgomery march. After that was over, SNCC was doing a lot of voter registration work. They had been doing it before the march, and they were doing it after. But there was a lot of um, uh, violence directed at the SNCC uh, uh, voter registration mm -hmm. work. And so uh, at one point, they asked for uh, assistance from people who wanted to support them, including friends of SNCC. So I, I answered that call with a group of other men, uh, young men and women, and we went down uh, to Alabama from, from Massachusetts. And I spent uh, uh, a couple of months, I think it was, uh, there. Um, and I got to see a few things. Uh, I must admit, uh, I'll be quite honest about it, I was scared to death most of the time. It's courageous work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, it was... Uh, uh, People had been shot. Uh, that's, it was not long after I arrived there that uh, that the woman, the wonderful woman from Detroit, Viola Luzzo, uh, who was uh, in a car uh, bringing food to uh, demonstrators, who, uh, she was shot in a drive-by shooting yeah, by, um, well, they never, they never determined who did it, but it was pretty obvious that it was coming from the uh, segregationist mm -hmm. uh, wing of things. Um, so it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was scary for me, but I learned a lot from it. And uh, here's, here's one thing I learned. We, one, one day we were um, marching down a street in Montgomery, state capital, Alabama, the birth, uh, heartland of the Confederacy during the Civil War, the place where George Wallace had stood up and said, uh, segregation now, segregation forever. Uh, and uh, so that was the city we were in, and we were walking through a neighborhood. It was pr uh, a white neighborhood, and people had been yelling about they were going to kill us and so forth, which you had to take seriously. It wasn't just rhetorical right. stuff. Um, and the door to a house that we were walking by opened. I remember having an initial reaction of, God, I hope there's not a shotgun coming out of that door. No, it wasn't. It was a, a white woman 
it was a very hot day, and she had a jug of ice water mm. that she offered to us uh, uh, to drink. And she had a lot of heart. She had a lot of guts. Seriously. Uh, you know, she, she lived there. We were marching through, but she lived there. Um, and it was not that I had, had a lot of built-in prejudices that way, but she was a good example of what, again, the red, you know, the red bearded man equation, which is you don't know. I mean, and uh, she was like some white people in the South, very concerned, obviously, about equality and treating people with decency. Mm -hmm. A lot of people weren't, but she was. She was. Can't can't judge a book by its cover, right? Uh, and that is, it's, I love the theme that we have through the whole show about that. It's just looking beyond someone's initial external appearance or your initial knee jerk reaction to what you think they are, and then taking a moment to really dive into understanding who they are. Right. And with the campaign, we're taking that approach. So instead of using voter rolls to decide on who we're going to go talk to because they're in the same party preference as I am, right? I'm only going to go talk to Democrats because they're the ones, of course, mm -hmm. that are going to vote for me. Maybe, right? now, mm -hmm. Nowadays, Democrats. But we need to reach across the divide and engage people in honest conversation about shared values. Right. I, I had a recent um, experience while I was walking neighborhoods over here in the West Side, and I went to the house of a guy named John. Mm -hmm. And... He invited me into his house, which I was not ready for. I was like, whoa, really? I'm canvassing neighborhoods, and you're going to invite me to come in and talk? That was fantastic. But through our conversation, he was a, a veteran from a foreign war. He was also a registered Republican. And we started talking about some of the mm -hmm. issues and some of the things we want to see change in the city. And I left the house with him offering us to put a yard sign in his front yard wow. for us to, you know, to, yeah, to right. make sure that people could see that he supports the messaging that we're trying yeah. to uh, that we're, we're, we're eliciting through the campaign and through the work that we're doing. That was just such an amazing experience because it affirmed everything that we're talking about of if I were to have not knocked on his door because of a letter next to his name, because of the party affiliation that he admittedly feels less connected to because of the current administration mm -hmm. and is contemplating re-registering because of the conflict that's going on, I would have never had a chance to meet him right. or come to those that level of connection. And he was such a sweet old guy. Mm -hmm. Like I, and he's has a little bit of difficulty getting out of the house. So there's a part of me that wants to help connect him to some of the senior services in town mm -hmm. that might be able to go by and deliver food or visit with him every once in a while. And it built that relationship between John and I that I, even in the 10 minutes that I spent with him, I feel so much closer to him than I did walking past his right, house. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Well, th let me just say, man, that you give me a lot of hope. <laughs> I, uh, You are uh, really on in the forefront of you know, that long historic struggle that's been going on and uh, your work, your interest in treating people decently, uh, recognizing diversity as a reality, not just a slogan, uh, is really important. And you are carrying on the, uh, the work of all those who have preceded you. So I, I appreciate you, man. <laughs> that, that, I can't I can't put into words how much that means come from someone like you, who's someone I strive to be like. So um, thank you for that. And, no, you, and the the mentioning of Selma, and you know, you had talked about your small role that you played mm -hmm. in the civil rights movement. In your words, small, in my perspective, grand, because you left the comfort of your own life to go down into a dangerous location to do work that a lot of people were fighting against you doing and putting yourself in the way of potential harm mm -hmm. for the benefit of a much larger population of people. And so it reminded me, because we've spoken about this before, about the cultural exchange trip that I coordinate right. to Selma, Alabama. Yeah, right. And this this year, when I took 11 other people with me to go and experience it just because of the impact that it had on me, there was a community elder there that we had at one of the beloved community dinners. And mm -hmm. she said, uh, she made this quote that I will never forget for my entire life because it, it hit me so hard. It, it was like, we're all 
each of us a piece of a giant puzzle, of a jigsaw puzzle. Think hmm. of us like that way, right? And you may think that your piece is totally insignificant and it doesn't matter amongst right. all of the other pieces. But when the puzzle is put together and your piece is the only one that's missing, <laughs> you become the most important piece of the puzzle. So everyone has a place that they fit right. into the movement. It's a matter of just figuring out that whether it be the movement or the community or the betterment of the world, we each have a calling or a purpose that we can serve or fill that will make the world a better place. And it's our jobs as individuals to help others find that passion, but then also to find that within ourselves so that we can feel pride and power in the work that we do instead of it just being another drudging day of, okay, I got to go to work, you know, right. just because right. I have to, we need to create systems and communities that offer potential for people to identify those passions, hone them, and then build and grow mm -hmm. so that they can spread that knowledge and ideally inspire someone else, whether it be in the community to carry on the work or in another place so that they can spread the message and kind of, uh, you know, disseminate it amongst different groups of people. It's every time I think of it and then you and it just brings so much joy uh, to me to think about the work. Well, th yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, and it's a wonderful image, the jigsaw puzzle with that one piece, because that piece sh shows up pretty big yep. when it's... Uh, well, he here's, here's another area that I learned. Uh, I, I tried to learn as much as I can, but I learned from participating uh, in the civil rights era. Uh, uh, two years before that, I had helped organize a small group from... Uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts, that went down to the March on Washington, 1963, mm -hmm. which is where King, of course, made his famous "I Have a Dream" speech. And I, you know, I thought about that years later. And there are there are there's a triptych, uh, a triangular set of events of which the march was part. Uh, the march took place on on uh, August 22nd, 1963. And by any definition, it was an amazing success. I mean, it surprised everyone how huge it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and but more than that, even the, the the speakers like John Lewis, who was brilliant, from John Lewis from SNCC, who's now a member of the House of Representatives, the oh, great yeah. John Lewis, uh, really uh, gave a, a wide ranging perspective on what needed to be done in society. Before that march, uh, in June, on June 12th, a man named Medgar Evers, oh field God. secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP in Mississippi, was assassinated in front of his house uh, with a high-powered rifle, by a high-powered rifle. Uh, it was a terrible murder. It, uh, it was done to undermine the NAACP in particular, but also the entire civil rights movement. Uh, a few uh, well, weeks after the march, uh, the 16th Street Baptist Church uh, in Alabama was blown up, killing several young black children who were there for Sunday school. Mm -hmm. So here you have an amazingly positive moment that's um, sandwiched in between two really terrible negative moments. Uh, I think what that taught me, uh, aside from the sorrow and the, the joy of the March on Washington and the sorrow for, about the other two uh, events, was um, to, be the, to be neither pessimistic nor optimistic. At any given moment, I would say a lot of what was going on in the civil rights movement was defeat. I mean, if you think about people getting beaten, getting killed, uh, churches being blown up, uh, demonstrations that didn't seem to have any immediate impact. So even if you succeeded in a demonstration, there were other things that were continuing. Uh, people were saying, yeah, well, it'll take a thousand years to change anything here. Um, but the defeats as well as the victories were all part of, perhaps it's a jigsaw puzzle, mm -hmm. they were all part of what became a very positive overall development, uh, which was the ending of legal segregation. Now, obviously, there's a lot that didn't get ended. Right. Some things have gotten worse. But the you know that kind of legal getting away with it segregation, no Negroes allowed, if they even were that polite about it, no Mexicans allowed or no Chinese allowed, whatever, that is no longer possible. And that's because of the 
uh, the activity of the civil rights movement as well as other movements. Um, so uh, all that development took place in a way that was not immediately visible at the time. I mean, I know, I know it was a movement, but my, my sense of it when I was in it was not that we were moving in a nice, straight, progressive path and everything was in sight. We were going to do X and Y, and then we were going to get, approach the great goal. It, things seemed very haphazard. I mean, not because of, the, uh, of organizing. I mean, the organizing part was well done, but you didn't know what kind of reactions you would get. Right. And uh, you could get beaten. You could get killed. You could get defeated. Uh, and yet, uh, things did change in ways. Look, if you, excuse me, if you would ask me in 1965, what's going to happen first? You're going to have a black president of the United States. I know he's not there anymore, but a black president of the United States or flying saucers are going to land. I would have said flying saucers are going to land. <laughs> Even though I was there trying to be a part of working toward change, it, we were confronted with a totalitarian system. Mm-hmm. The governor, the the the, 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 uh, the state legislature, the sheriffs, the law enforcement, the judges, everything was stacked against change. And yet things did change in ways that everyone was surprised at. I know there are limits to that change, but it still was, went far beyond anything I could imagine. I think most people could imagine. I'm mentioning all this in part because of the situation we're in now in the United States. Mm-hmm. We're in a terrible situation. Uh, it's very dangerous. That's obvious. Um, and uh, I know that there might be uh, a tendency to feel pessimistic. Um, I mean, I'm not j- jumping up and clicking my heels together about what's going on, but um, things are unpredictable. Mm-hmm. And in Alabama in 1965, it didn't seem like anything was going to change, and yet it did. Uh, I'm counting on the 2018 election uh, to b- bring a, something of a modification in the current situation, and I have a great deal of faith in the progressive people of the United States, such as yourself, mm-hmm. uh, who know what needs to be done and who, who will fight to, go, to do it uh, in a nonviolent way, of course, right. uh, uh, regardless of whether we win or lose at any given moment, because there's a lot of losing in the winning. That's the thing with nonviolence and something that provides me with endless motivation, right, and endless focus is that nonviolence is not a linear process. Mm. You know, I train in an after school program that I designed at a local high school at Kirby where I walk the students through the six steps of a nonviolent action campaign, and we actually design a nonviolent action campaign for them to administer at the school to make mm-hmm. some kind of Great. change happen. It was an amazing experience this last year with the students and what they were able to accomplish around racism and uh, the ability to discuss it at school in a comfortable way, as well as education around it. But it's not a one, two, three, four, five, six step process because there's educating and or gathering information and educating people mm-hmm. and making personal commitments and, you know, getting ready for negotiations and then conducting direct actions and reconciliation. You always want to get to reconciliation, but because you start at gathering information and then educating people and then making your own personal commitment, you could go to negotiations and then it could resolve itself and go to reconciliation. But maybe you go to negotiations, find out you need more information, go back and get it, re-educate yourself, recommit, mm-hmm. and then go back to negotiations. They don't work. You do a nonviolent direct action and have to go back to the education right. process. And it's this cycle of consistently working towards the, the cause because you believe in the goal and right. doing it and accepting whatever suffering comes along with it without retaliation mm-hmm. so that you can maintain that moral high ground in the argument and move forward into achieving what you're working towards because you believe it to be the morally and morally and philosophically right thing to do right. and move yep. forward into that. And people sometimes critique nonviolence around that. It doesn't, it doesn't work fast enough. It's like, that's never going to work. We're never going to be able to overcome these power structures. But it's the sixth principle of Kingian nonviolence, mm-hmm. that the universe is on the side of justice, that the universe, the spirit, God, whatever you call it, mm-hmm. has a preferential focus on justice and equity and balance. It's the whole idea of balance, even in Eastern religions, the idea of balance and talking about how things must maintain the sense of unity and cohesion. 
and everything's coming back that way. So if we can continue pushing forward in a nonviolent way to build community and bring people together, then eventually it will change and make a difference. And like you've said, we've seen that over time where seems things seems thing to, things seemed impossible, but then after diligent work from people, it was able to happen. So we've talked so far about your history, Native Americans, uh, hit and uh, examples of trans communality and peace work over there, prison systems, um, uh, inmates, and the work around nonviolence and Kingian nonviolence, the civil rights movement. Let's talk about issues of Santa Cruz okay. really quick, because all of this stuff that we've kind of laid the framework with feeds directly into everything that we're dealing with here in Santa Cruz, like some of the really divisive issues. You know, I spoke with a a community elder at the farmer's market the other day who was expressing his desire and intention to leave Santa Cruz because of the amount of racism that we have here mm -hmm. and that he's still experiencing. We have people that are as you know, families living in their cars with children as young as eight, trying to figure out how they're going to raise money so that they can help their family pay rent. Right. And then that brings in the whole question of rent control. And so all of these issues are really divisive to, if you say to people in Santa Cruz that there's racism, you're going to get a lot of pushback if you talk about the need for more affordable housing development because people are uh, living on the streets, but it's not profitable for developers. You're going to get pushback. Or, for example, when you want to protect people from getting priced out of their houses or because an apartment association wants to increase the rent because of the influx of students mm -hmm. that are coming in. But that is going to limit the potential of profit making for other landlords. And we're getting pushback. Mm -hmm. How, from your perspective, with trans communality and the idea of working across these divisions, how do we mediate these conversations and what methods can we use to find common ground mm -hmm. to work through them and come out the other side more unified instead of more polarized? Right, right. Well, it's not easy. Um, there are a couple of elements or several elements in trans commonality. One of them is face-to-face uh, -face interaction. Uh, and the other is connected to that, it's what I call shared practical action. So uh, working together with people on some, let's say it's a, uh, just to take a hypothetical example, uh, say it's a landlord and a, and a person who can't afford housing. But suppose both those individuals were working together on a project, let's say, uh, um, something like uh, uh, farm workers in Salinas who are suffering from herbicide, pesticide uh, use. Mm -hmm. So that has nothing to do particularly in a direct way with what's going on in San, like Santa Cruz between those two individuals, but they're working together uh, on another issue. Mm -hmm. uh, in doing that, they might start to get to know each other. They might uh, say, oh, you know, I, I, I like what you did with, uh, with this. Or thanks for bringing up, uh, you know, how to, how to reach out to people in Salinas. And um, so I, I'm a big believer in uh, shared practical action, which is not easy to do. But I find that when we actually do work together, well, let's put it this way. There's a lot of limit to how much we can talk about cooperation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like doing cooperation. Right. Doing it, it, uh, it opens one up to other people as human beings, uh, as fallible human beings. So, you know, someone asked me to set up the chairs for a meeting and I figured I had to do it. I say, yeah, how did you do that, man? Uh, you know, uh, well, I say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. He said, yeah, okay, well, I, we all make mistakes. And so uh, those kinds of interactions mm -hmm. are priceless uh, because they allow us to uh, see people in settings where we're not already antagonistic about the, those settings. I mean, there's something else going on. Uh, now, that's not easy to do, and uh, I, I, I'm, not grand, I'm not presenting it as a grand strategy, but uh, in the age of the internet, I would say face-to-face, -face, working together, like say on the uh, community garden, a community garden project. Mm -hmm. uh, like which beach flats, yeah. Beach flats. Could bring in People from many different. I think it does. It you does, know, bring, yeah. it brings, and that's a great, the, the beach flats project is a great example of face to face shared practical action where people learn about each other and yeah, warts and all, right? You mm -hmm. know, like you find out. Oh, gee, I don't like the way you said that. But you know, 
But on the other hand, he does this pretty well. So, and uh, he didn't like the way I said something, but I, on the other hand, we're working together on this. So, uh, it, it's not easy to set up those kinds of settings, uh, but I think they're very, uh, very important. And certainly the Peacemaker, the Longhouse, all that was about shoulder to shoulder, being in the same, pro- and being in proximity and doing things together when it was necessary. The, uh, the important thing, especially in those interactions, because I, I like that you said in the age of the internet, because whenever I get into a conversation on the internet with someone and then they just are relentlessly coming at me like, I'm never right. going to get through this person if I type another sentence. I will always offer them to come and meet with me in person right. so that right. we can sit and talk with yeah. each other and look in each other's eyes instead of looking at a screen and then getting built up and frustrated about it. Uh, another thing with that, like you mentioned, it is difficult sometimes to do that shared practical activism because of the small conflicts that come up. Right. But that's why I love Kingian nonviolence, mm-hmm. and especially Kingian nonviolence in the form of conflict reconciliation, mm-hmm. because it trains us to acknowledge and be able to observe those small, normal conflicts. Mm-hmm. The more of those small, normal conflicts that build up, say, you know, say I meet someone new for the first time and we're organizing and they do something that irks me. If I don't say anything and they do that thing over and over again or they do a bunch of other little things, I'm going to get really irritated with them and come out with this idea. I really don't like that person. They do these things all the time that annoy me, but it, it's only because I've never told them right. that they annoy me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so how are they ever going to stop doing them if I don't tell them? And if we can avoid moving it from a normal type of conflict to a pervasive type of conflict where we start seeing elevated tones and the conflict really starts, mm-hmm. we're able to work through that conflict in a way that is both uh, beneficial for each of the groups, but also helps each person to grow because they're able to identify, oh, I didn't I didn't know that my actions would cause this negative effect in someone. Mm-hmm. I should be more conscious about that when I'm around other people that may share this identity or these ideas. Um, mm-hmm. Another thing that came to mind when you were talking was a story that Dr. Bernard Lafayette told me while I was, he was mm-hmm. training me for Kingian nonviolent trainings here in Santa Cruz. Mm-hmm. I was fortunate enough to get That's trained great. by yeah, he's great. the legend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he was talking about how they were in a march in Selma for voting rights, and he was taking up the rear to just to make sure that there was nothing coming from behind. And this group of anti-protesters come up behind them, spitting on them, you know, these white protesters right. saying, hey, you know, get out of here, calling them names. But he notices that one of the guys has a, a mechanics jacket on with, mm-hmm. with hot rod logo on it. And so it strikes up a conversation <laughs> with the guy about hot rods, <laughs> about, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And by the time they get to the church where the march was going, they realized that all the other counter protesters had gone away, except for the one white gentleman in the mechanics outfit mm-hmm. who was still talking about hot rods. <laughs> and then Dr. Lafayette said he never saw him again in another counter protest because of that. You know, he attributes it to be finding that common ground and common interest that allowed them to see these people are no different than us. They just want equal rights. Right. right. And, you know, uh, that's a that's a great story. I love that. Um in a way, we, we do this all the time just in personal relationships. My wife and I have been, we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. And you know, she's put up with me for 40, <laughs> 40 years. years. That's good. But, you know, 40 years is a long time. You know, a long time to have a lot of arguments about this and that and uh, differences of opinion and perspective. But we both, and I especially, have learned from that interaction you know, I'm a better man today than I was 40 years ago due to my wife and due to my her interaction with me. Mm-hmm. And so the human brain can handle it. Right. We, you know, it's it's there. We do it. And not, not all relationships, you know, work out. Sometimes, and you, you go from there. But mentally, human beings, we're, we're, we're hardwired to be cooperative and to learn from interaction if we just don't let other things get in the way of that. And so, um, you know, my, my, my marriage, what I've learned from that marriage, uh, what I've learned from my wife has been a tremendous influence on me in many ways, including thinking, wow, if you can do this as, an indivi- as individuals, we ought to be able to do it as groups of individuals. Do it as a group, yep. And so from all the research that I've done in transcommunality and getting ready to meet and talk with you and just throughout time listening to your talks and uh, reading some of the work that you've put out, transcommunality sounds ideal, right, in a way to achieve yeah. social justice, but I can imagine, like you'd mentioned before, that it sometimes can be difficult and emotionally mm-hmm. draining for people, yeah. especially if you're coming from a perspective and you know I, I like this i'm gonna pause for a second uh, still sure. in, in the show but just the uh there was a person that i work with 
who's a volunteer and he's married to the, um, this woman who's originally from Chile. And I was using the term people of color and he, he, he came up to me. He's like, you know, she really doesn't like that term. And I was like, and it's funny because I've had this conversation that mm. went from Negro to colored people to people of color. Right. And like, what is the best term? <laughs> but she came up with this term that she prefers the global majority. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that's got a totally different connotation to it. I'm, yeah. I'm a part of the global majority. I'm not a person of color. I'm a part of the global majority. <laughs> but um, especially if you're someone that is a part of the global majority that is experiencing pressures from white supremacy or or if you're uh, someone that identifies as a woman and then experiencing patriarchy and misogyny, it can be especially draining because you're having to consistently c let people know that what they're doing is either bothering you, offensive, unconscious, um, invasive, you know, all these other kinds of things. So since self-care, I come from a position that self-care is incredibly important mm -hmm. and it's something that I could probably do more of in my own life. Uh, but what are some of the things that you would suggest to help peace builders take care of themselves or individuals take care of themselves amidst that work of trans communality and building the shared community? And how do you, how do you never lose faith? Uh, I think it's what's helped me is knowing the past. I mean, that's not the only part of this, but, but, and you, you, you mentioned this at the very beginning of our uh, conversation here um, is recognizing that there are those who have preceded us, like Gandhi, for example, or, or King, or Ella Baker. Yeah, by the way, Ella Baker, for those who don't know her, uh, she was, the, as Drew pointed out, the co-founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. She was a brilliant strategist, a really compassionate, a really thoughtful person, and uh, I, I wish there was more uh, light shown on her, because she, in some ways, uh, is a great example of someone, when you read about her, you say, wow, if she could do that under those circumstances, I ought to be able to do what I'm trying to do mm -hmm. uh, under circumstances that might not be quite as, as dire. And that's the way I feel about the men in Soledad. If they can be positive and proactive and trying to do the right thing inside prison, I ought to be able to try to do, be able to do the right thing outside. Because mm -hmm. uh, if they can do it under those circumstances, uh, uh, I, I should be able to duplicate it under less painful circumstances. So looking at predecessors, looking at people who are uh, out there today, contemporaries who are working under very difficult circumstances, but who remain positive, uh, I think, uh, number one, it makes you realize you're not alone, mm -hmm. and that's always a good feeling. And secondly, that uh, people have been able to muster the, the courage and determination and the discipline under difficult circumstances to do that uh, helps me to keep my own uh, little patch of this uh, in perspective. And to be, uh, you know, stronger because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, is there anything that you recommend people do when they're feeling <clears throat> like they're reaching burnout? Or, I mean, from yeah. your experience, you've done a lot of work in a bunch of different um, areas. And so, you know, when you feel like you're getting a little overwhelmed or overloaded or you just had a really frustrating situation with someone that you were trying really hard to connect with, what do you do to kind of release or relax? Uh, music. Music, <laughs> yeah, music. I've, I loved what you. I loved the introductory music, man. You really did. It. You were right on target there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I'm not being facetious. I mean, for me anyway, uh, music, uh, African American classical music, uh, uh, Chinese music. I mean, there's a lot of different kind of musics that I I listen to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Tibetan music uh, and. I, it's just me, but at night, uh, when we're, you know, in bed, we're reading, uh, I, I, I put on the sound and I, I go to sleep with it. Mm -hmm. Um, now, you know, that's just me, but I, I, I do that cause it makes me feel good. And, uh, it's something that is not about having to use the analytical tools and to be out there doing, uh, uh, difficult things, which I can do or try to, but it's about uh, being in touch with something that is not about confrontation, but it's about 
uh, rest. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's a, there's a um, there's a poem. Uh, it's um, oh god, I'm blocking the name of the poet. Uh, it might be Cummings, but it's uh, "Be still and be still moving." Mm-hmm. If I can think of the name of the poet, I'll do it at some point. Uh, so I like that. Be still, you know, rest, but be still moving. Right. He said, just keep, <laughs> keep on keeping on. Uh, and the, the other thing that I do is I, I, I like, uh, I get out in nature, so to speak. And I'm out, I go for short hikes and mm-hmm. out there commuting, uh, commuting with the coyotes and the barn owls. And uh, it, for me, uh, it, uh, it puts me in touch with the universe. That's, that's what, just me. That's, that, just, that's my... Uh my release person. I have my little dog courage. And so whenever I get a chance and I need to kind of relax, I go out and walk in the woods with him and just kind of be quiet and sometimes even just be still, just stand there and like listen around and acknowledge the animals and <clears throat> the environment and remind my, you know, sometimes it takes a reminder of why you're right. doing the work. Like what, why am I putting myself through all of this stress and strain? And then you go, Oh Yeah the world. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's yeah, why. There, there was a world out there, yeah. yeah. The other night, I was out walking, and uh, a barn owl, it was in, or early evening, a barn owl flew near me, and for a moment, he or she uh, looked, cocked its head and looked direct me directly in the eye. So for about five seconds, I was in direct contact with this owl. Then it just went on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, was, it was beautiful. And very restful. And the name of the poet is T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just looking it up, and that was the one. Yeah, yeah be Eliot. still and uh, be still and be still moving. And that's uh, so. I mean, other people have different things, but I, I think in some way, shape, or form, doing something that is not necessarily goal oriented uh, at a certain time of day or a certain day of the week is helpful. Mm. Wise words. That brings us to the end of the program. Okay. Um, if you've officially endorsed the campaign. You already said <clears throat> some really uh, amazing words. Is there anything else that you want to add to just why someone of your amazing caliber is supporting the work that we're doing here in Santa Cruz and my candidacy for the city council? Well, uh, as I said before, you know, I am, I am uh, exhilarated by your presence on the political scene. I mean, uh, we really need in this country right now uh, younger people who are willing to take up the challenge of bringing us to a society that Ella Baker imagined, a society that permits people to grow and develop themselves and give themselves a sense of value. Uh, and for, for ourselves and for others to do that, and that's what you're doing. And obviously there are very specific issues you're working on, but what I see all those specific issues as part of is a framework of compassion. Mm-hmm. And compassion is a, a wonderful, a wonderful virtue, and you have that for sure. And so, I'm any any political figure who has compassion. I'm going to support, and I fully support you for that. Well, thank you, John. You just heard it from the man himself, local legend John Brown Childs. It's been an honor to have you on the show, my friend. But yeah, it's great conversations talking about trans communality, the ways that we can work together across different divisions and lines, and the importance of coming together as a community to make a Santa Cruz that works for everybody. John Brown Childs is a professor emeritus of sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's also an author, a scholar, like I mentioned, a professor before, and someone that volunteers with the Barrios Nidos Prison Project down in Soledad Prison. If you want to check out more with John and what he's been working on, there'll be links down in the comments so you can check it out on your own and get a much deeper understanding of trans communality from his talks, his writings, and just experiencing the man himself. Hopefully you can meet him in real life. Next week, we have a special guest. It'll be an amazing conversation once again. This is Pod for the People. If this was your first episode, we have five others like it that came before it. So you can tune in uh, and subscribe so you'll get updates. Go on to drewgloververforcitycouncil.com so you can sign up for our newsletter, get updates about upcoming events, or find out ways that you can plug into the campaign and find a way that you can help to build a stronger Santa Cruz 
by working with us to bridge people together. My name is Drew Glover, candidate for the Santa Cruz City Council election this November, born and raised here in Santa Cruz, president of the United Nations Association. What else? I work at the Resource Center for Nonviolence. I sit on the city's commission for the prevention of violence against women. I'm the founder and director of Project Pollinate. I work at the Resource Center for Nonviolence as a Kingian nonviolence instructor. And today, I went over to the Office of Education and applied to be an instructional aide to begin my process in becoming a teacher uh, after my studies at UCSC. So tune in next week. Every Tuesday, we come out with a new podcast. You can stay up to date on all of the great stuff. And I'll talk to you later. Thanks for tuning in.